Look like Madonna with the... <laughs> yes. Well, good evening, boy. I'm, I'm Paul Rose, and, and I'm here to, to push the case and remind everybody here about how we measure things, particularly value, and how we can value adventure and exploration and field science. But firstly, I'd just like to say that this is living proof that you don't have to wear a hair shirt to make good things happen. You know, this is a fun conference. It's informative. We've got the people from all over the world, people from all different kinds of faiths and unifying principles and people of ideas. And yet, it's fun and it's in a great setting and we've got the power of the wilderness just outside these doors. And yet, we're all doing, we just happen to be doing the right thing. And I think that's part of the future, that we can do the right thing and it can be easy and fun. And one of the ways that we come unstuck is we all walk out of conferences like this and we're asked to value it. And people often say, what did you learn? How is it going to make a difference? What is the value? And we're always asked to quantify and value these things. And yet, I'm dreaming of a future not too far away where we put value on things that we can't always measure by profit. I can't always measure by shareholders or something like that. We need to somehow find a way to value the invaluable, the intrinsic things. And we know instinctively that they're right. We know, for instance, that life is a bit out of balance on the planet when we've got 7.3 billion of us. And for the first time in history, we've become a true force of nature. And yet, we've never lived so far from nature with 60% of us living in urban environments, and so many people these days not realizing that we need nature, it doesn't need us, just stands to reason there's an out-of-balance situation. I'm just picking small examples. I know you can pick lots. And what about um, the oceans? You know, it can't be right and it can't be sustainable that every single drop of the ocean has microplastic in it. If we go to the regions that I travel a lot to, the polar regions, and put a water sample in there, it'll come up with plastic in it. That's not right. It can't be right that we've overfished. It can't be right that if I'm, if I'm in America eating shrimp, chances are that that shrimp has been dragged off the bottom. Um, it's then been flown to Asia, where it's been prepared, and then flown back to the US and sold as US shrimp because it makes economic sense, but it, stands, it doesn't feel right. It's an out-of-balance situation, and it can't be right that we lose so much habitat and so many valuable species in the world. Well, what are we doing about them? Well, from the overpopulation point of view, oddly enough, uh, might surprise many, uh, maybe not, that one of the great leadership examples has been in Bangladesh. We sort of change when we have to, don't we? No one changes when we're super comfortable. And I was there in Bangladesh as a guest of Mohammed Yunus reporting on his work, and I was asked to make a comment about overpopulation. As you might know, Bangladesh had an enormous growth. Um, and the script said, Bangladesh is so crowded that if you took the whole of the world and put everybody into the lower 48 states of America, it wouldn't be as packed as Bangladesh. And I remember thinking, that can't be right. And I was sitting on the toilet with a pen doing, doing division and multiplication and working out as, with my phone square miles and square... to realize, well, it's absolutely true. Can you believe it? And then the oceans, there are lots of good ocean projects. Uh, but, you know, if you'll excuse me a, a moment on my project, which is called Pristine Seas for National Geographic. I'm the leader of these expeditions. And we go... We, our, our mission is to save the last wild places on the ocean. So we go to pristine regions. We've done nine of them so far. Um, the last two that I've led was in France, Joseph Land, Arctic, Russia, and I'm recently back from Mozambique. And it's, we use the powerful combination of first-class science and compelling media to, to influence governments and, and leaders to make the right decisions about protecting the ocean. We've so far protected nearly a million square kilometers. And there's a lovely project very close to here at IUCN headquarters in Glon, um, uh, which is called SOS, Save Our Species. And that's what we're doing about the loss of these valuable species. You, you probably know something called the red list. When things become very rare and threatened, they pop up on this red list. And when they really get in trouble and they're on the brink um, of being a viable population, they hit something called the SOS list. And there's 90 of these SOS projects. And of course, it's very successful because we act when we know we absolutely have to. So with all these things going on, how do we know all this? And, and by the way, how do we know any of our 
mathematical models for ESG and impact and biomimicry investing work. We know that because people go to the front line. Adventurers, explorers, and people like me that lead science projects, we go out there and we measure things and we bring them back. And we, it's like the leap across the species. I come in with my knuckles dragging on the ground covered in frost and I give you the data and something marvelous happens and you come up with a, with a business around it. Or, but of course, we have to go there. And if we go to the front line, we have to go there with a sense of intuition, uh, dare I say it, courage, and a sense of enthusiasm that brings the story back. For instance, on my BBC program just a couple of years ago, I was super keen to talk about the age of the oceans. Four billion years ago, the oceans weren't the beautiful, blue, oxygen-rich, life-giving things they are today. They were dark, anoxic, lifeless places. And in the Bahamas, there's a hole called the Black Hole very deep, 55 meter enclosed hole, not one of the blue ones that runs into the sea. And a scientist had been there rowing out a little boat, putting down a sample bottle and pulling up water that was exactly the same as our oceans were four billion years ago. But how can this be? So we went out, I got permission to dive it, no one had ever dived it, and just to see what this water was like down there. There's no good talking about it, you need to be amongst it to tell powerful stories. And I remember going into this big hole uh, about a kilometre across, and getting down to about 17 metres deep and finding the bottom. And I thought, this makes no sense. This is supposed to be 55 metres deep. So I discovered that the bottom was very soft. And those of you that dive in uh, you know, freshwater lakes, you're used to soft, uh, set, silty bottoms. And I let myself sink into the bottom, and it felt very hot, and I thought, that's... And I remember thinking, this is a weird thing. And I kept going down. And by forcing myself down and making myself heavy, I was went down in this hot potato soup thing. And I kept forcing myself down, and, uh, and I could smell rotten eggs. And when you're diving, your nose is enclosed. It's not usual to smell. So I kept forcing myself down in this hole, and, and after about a further 10 meters down, and there was all these green lights and purple streams in front of my eyes, and I began to feel really weird and very hot. I popped through this hanging layer. You see, it was a suspended layer from 17 meters down to about 27 meters. And I then arrived into this incredibly black, blessedly cool, dead water. Exactly the same as our oceans were four billion years ago. So of course, while I'm telling that story, I'm thinking, wow, this is an incredible experience. No one's ever been here before. I do have to admit to you that I wasn't completely sure I'd pop back up again. <laughs> and so when I got down, before we got the camera in, I stayed under the layer and sort of pushed myself back up and convinced myself I could come up through it. And we had a number of dives there and told this very compelling story. Uh, and people will watch. They won't necessarily hear everything about the chemistry of our oceans four billion years ago and how we got oxygen into them, but they'll get it because they'll see me in a powerful place, which sort of almost gives me a license to tell powerful stories. And people do listen. Um, Similarly, when we were talking about six-gill sharks, not many know that in the Mediterranean there are very big ancient sharks that have six gills. Most sharks have five. No one had ever dived with one. They had pictures from submarines. They come up from 2,000 meters depth. And it was important to show the age of sharks and the difference between the animals that have cartilage and those that have bones. So we managed to get to the right spot, which happens to be between the Straits of Messina and mainland, uh, which is the Straits of Messina between Sicily and mainland Italy. Um, and we heard there that they can come up, they, they've been filmed with remote vehicles coming up from 2,000 meters to about 50 meters deep in the Straits. And I had two or three dives to try and get to this thing. And it's a complete, as you can imagine, needle in a haystack job. Um, you can't just swim around hope to bump into a shark in a new moon when it's dark. So we swam around and I remember coming up and speaking to the director, totally focused on getting what in television terms we call the two shot, me and a six gill shark. I just felt it had to happen. But it's, you know, the, the chances are just you know, immeasurably slim. So she said to me, we can't just keep traveling the world not finding things. Um, so, you, you know, this is your last chance, basically. So it was three in the morning, because uh, we kept going when the tide was slack. I decided then to go when the tide was really ripping, because it's a very energetic bit of water. And I thought, if I go when the tide is ripping, I'll cover more ground. I carried very different uh, scuba diving equipment, which was very, very big, which meant I could spend a long time down there. 
And as we were going out, our Sicilian boat captain said, how do you know if the shark comes to you, if you bump into the shark, it will come to you anyway? I mean, this thing could come to your cameraman, to your lighting man, to your safety diver, to the cameraman's safety diver. So there's seven of us down there to make it look as if I'm on my own. And I remember saying, we are going to get lucky. And um, he said, no, and he went to the back of his boat and he brought up this very large piece of fresh tuna. And he said, hey, you want to you wanna tie that on your, on your belt? And he said it half jokingly. And I remember our previously risk-averse director at the front of the boat suddenly jumped up and said, that's it, get it on him, get it on him. Tie it. And uh, so I was, okay, so I tied this big lump of tuna on me and uh, uh, swam around down there in the dark for about 45 minutes, thinking I would never see him. And then sure enough, this prehistoric shark with, you know, these are big, these are, you know, five meters long with big green eyes, big, huge predatory things came and spent a glorious 10 minutes with me. So the first dive I would never repeat, um, that's for sure. We didn't feel very well after. We discovered that that layer is, 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 a, neuro, is a topically absorbent neurotoxin. It's hydrogen sulfide producing bacteria. Uh, but as you can tell, it's done me no harm whatsoever. The second dive, I would, I would do anything to repeat that dive. But it's not always for communication that we do this stuff. People like me have to do it. You know, explorers, adventurers, scientists, people at the front line, we, we can't help ourselves. If there's a map and it says, here be monsters, we want to be there. You know, if there's a chance of sailing somewhere where you can't get rescued, or if there's a chance of traveling where you can't get, you know, even though you've got a satellite phone and GPS, but you think, wow, if I come unstuck here, it's still going to take so long that no one's going to be able to rescue me. That, to us, is the green lights. All the green lights are on, and we're going to go. We just can't stop it. But there's even benefit there, you know, with that, that sense of intuition and confidence that comes from that. I, I look upon it as a sense of geography. When I do, I lead, I lead these journeys across the Greenland ice cap. I was the first person to lead commercial journeys, do Nansen's route, you know, from east to west, Amasalik to Kanguluswak in Greenland. 420 kilometers, it's 30 days, and it mathematically, for those of you who are in, you know, mathematics, in a bit, it doesn't work. You can't actually do it because it, you look at how far you can go every day and how, how much, how big of a load you can drag, completely under supported, unsupported. It doesn't work. And when you start the journey, it doesn't work. Because after the first day, you've done eight kilometers, you're completely exhausted. You're sitting in a tent and the map is this wide and you've gone that far. You think, well, 30 of them, we're going to run out of food. We're, it's never going to happen. But there's a magic that works. We can't carry more food or we'd never get to the other side. But what happens every day, we eat a bit of food and use a bit of fuel. Sledge gets a bit lighter. We get a bit more determined. We make eight kilometers, 12, 20, a big day of 25. Big storms come. But the thing about crossing the ice cap, you can't stop. You've got to move in big storms. If you sit there and eat, you've had it. The first time I did the ice cap crossing, we had three days where we had no mileage, no food. But you get to the other side with nothing left in the sledge, having made it. And you know, there's the sense of confidence that you can actually make it is unbelievably beautiful. It really is. And, I, and that's the kind of thing that I recognize in, in people here, but I can only put it into a wilderness exploring perspective. But of course, the thing that makes, makes the wilderness and adventuring and exploring so evocative is a double-edged sword. And we can't hide from it. If we make mistakes, we can't say, well, it's the policy, or it was my boss, or it, was, it wasn't on my shift. I went home at six o'clock and the computers crashed at half past six. It's, it's down to me, isn't it, if things go wrong? And I clearly remember um, diving under a big ice, uh, diving under, normally in Antarctica we dive under the ice, but um, when we're blessed in the summer with ice-free zones, we obviously dive where it's ice-free, and it feels a bit like the diving you'd see anywhere in the world. And I was diving there with a new scientist, and we'd lost some equipment. We'd lost a big sediment trap in the bottom at 40 meters. And I said, come, let's just go find this sediment trap as an exploratory dive for her. And we went down. We, s we dropped a line to the bottom, and then we had a boy on the top. And the way you search for things underwater is ever-decreasing circles around this line. So you know you've done that bit, and then you move it and find the next bit. Um, we swam in this gloomy water. It's very nutrient-rich water, Antarctic water, so you can't see much all the time. And um, we hadn't found it, so fair enough. We came up our line, and instead of coming up in 42 meters of water, 
we popped up a bit higher than this ceiling and banged our heads. And I thought, that's banged our heads and I looked up and it was a big piece of ice. And as you know, 80% of an iceberg is underwater. So we realized that a big piece of ice had, bloke, had broken away from the pack and had run over our position. So our line was this way and I remember following this line along and after a very short distance, we came to our boy. So which way to go? And I remember seeing light. So we thought, great, we're okay, we'll swim up. And we swam up quite a long way, about another 15 meters and hit our heads again because the underneath of icebergs is very complex. And at that moment, I remember looking at Lucy, who was a new diver, remember, new to Antarctica. And she gave me a look I shall never forget, and it was basically, you don't need to worry about me. And it was really something in that look, and I can remember it at this moment, because if she had panicked, we would both be in trouble, because at the end of the dive, you're coming up, because that's the end of your time underwater, decompression-wise, and also that's the end of your air. So I remember that look, and I remember thinking, wow. So then we had to go down into the dark again, and we had two or three of these false misses and lots of just cruising along, watching the air go down, watching the time go by until we finally popped out on the other side. And we only did that because Lucy, as a very inexperienced diver, kept her head on and because we just got very, very lucky indeed. And the other side of that double-edged sword is when you get unlucky, but it's actually not so life-threatening. And I clearly remember the first time I guided in Greenland, I'd been doing these ice cap crossings, and I had an opportunity to guide the mountains in Greenland, because that's the highest peaks in the Arctic. And there's, when you get to the top of Gumbion Field, the highest in the Arctic, you look around and 90% of what you see is unclimbed, unmapped, unnamed, unphotographed, un unvisited, complete virgin peaks. So we tried to climb Gumbion Field by a new route. It had been climbed previously by the Southern Ridge, and I thought the North Face would be possible. So I took a group there and we pushed up in very bad weather um, but in, with the keenness that comes and I'm not talking as if I was 19 and I was keen, this was only six years ago you know, and uh, fired up, sorry 10 years ago, fired up, no, 2002 whenever that was, 12 years ago and f fired up to push to the summit. We moved through bad weather and bad weather and bad weather and we reached the summit. And you know what happens when you reach summit on a real, on a, in a hostile place. You want to get pictures, get your gloves back on, get organized and get back down again because you've done it. And after two weeks of pushing, that was our mission. And just then the clouds cleared a bit, these swirling clouds. I mean, it was so minus 30, big winds, very poor visibility. We'd been climbing, technical climbing for weeks. The clouds cleared and my son, who was helping me on that trip, said, that's funny, Dad. What's that then? And quite obviously, we climbed the wrong mountain. <laughs> and um, we'd, there's a, there's, there's, when the sun's out, it's blindingly obvious which way you go. Um, but me as the big mountain leader, you know, I was determined. This was, so it was a new route. And on the, that peak on the Greenlandic maps um, is now called uh, Paul's Mirage. And um, I, I went back. I did go back. And, and we did actually do the North Face route. And that is in. Uh, by, by. So this is the sort of enthusiasm and courage and instinct that I want to bring to the business world. You know, I start off by talking about the hair shirt. You know, we, we don't have to feel uncomfortable or miserable when we're doing the right thing. And at the moment, so, mu so much business and politics and, and leadership and people of influence, the easy decision is really the wrong one. You know, keep going the same old track, the same old model, get, get out of the office six o'clock. You know, this is, the, you know, get, keep the shareholders happy, keep the boss happy, retire in a few years, you know, I dream of the day when, and this is the start of, this is an essential part of the movement, when the right decisions are the easy ones and the people of influence go, oh, absolutely, that's obviously the right thing to do. It's easy, it's fun, it's simple, it's, it's profitable, it's sustainable, and it's obviously the right thing to do. And I feel that is a great aim. I feel this movement is the one to really kick this off. And um, I applaud all the work you do and thank you for having me here tonight. Thank you.